How good is this? I feel like a little kid when I'm up here on these rocks. Now, when my family would go to the beach, the rest of my family enjoyed being on the sandy part and swimming or sunbaking. I loved hitting these headlands and exploring over the rocks. I think this is just about the first day of uh, proper sunlight that I've had since starting. Started about 10 days ago. I've had a little bit of sunshine breakthrough for probably 10 or 15 minutes over the last 10 days, but this is the first time that there's blue skies. It's still about minus seven, I think, but there's potential. I grew up on an island off the northeastern tip of Tasmania, and on that island, right up the top of it, there was a headland similar to this, and the tide was out the day we were there. I was able to get down onto the sand in front of the rocks and explore along the edge of them. And whilst exploring, I found a sea cave. Right onto the sand, I'd never seen it before, and I went up into this sea cave. And as a little kid, six or seven years of age, I felt like I'd found a pirate's lair. It felt like the, the perfect place for a, a pirate to dig their treasure. And I was exploring the cave, I was having fun, and then all of a sudden, water lapped up against my feet. And I turned around and realised the tide had come in. And it had come in so much and so quickly that in order to go out of the cave, I had to go down, out into the open ocean and around the headland, which as a child, I knew it was far too dangerous. I wasn't going to get out of that cave. I went further up into the cave and right up in the top of it, I could see there was a hole. And I had to climb up out of that cave. And I got about halfway up this ledge, but I had to climb up this wall and it felt like a very long way. I remember getting stuck halfway. I was slipping and I, I didn't feel like I could go forwards or if I try to go backwards, I think I just lose my grip and fall anyway. And just feeling isolated. I hadn't told my parents where I was going. No one knew I was there. And as a six or seven year old, knowing I can't get out of this sea cave and it is going to fill with water, I have no choice. I have to go up. very slowly inched my way up out of that cave and squeezed through the hole, which I now know is a blowhole. If you go back there at high tide, water shoots out of that hole. I've never forgotten how close that encounter was with the wild elements, just how dangerous this can be. But there's also a deeper encounter that being at the spiritual level, when we are brought to the brink, when we come to that point of realising just how fragile our existence is. Well, this is it. After a, look, probably a bit under 500 kilometres from Moscow, this is the border between Belarus and Russia. I think the border's still a couple of k's off, but this big lineup of trucks is certainly a pretty good indication that the border's up here. When I was in Russia, I was walking down the side of the road, actually a fairly nice day. It was, everything was covered in snow, but it was sunny. 
and I was walking down the road as I did every day praying a rosary and it happened to be that I was praying the fourth decade of the sorrowful mysteries the carrying of the cross up Calvary and as I meditated on that decade what resonated with me particularly and what I was meditating on was the docility of Christ before his aggressors the fact that he did not retaliate and as I walked down the road meditating on that and up until that point the many years leading up until that point any time I'd thought about that go Jesus that's great you love us by showing this it just didn't mean that much to me other than to think oh Jesus persevered for us just got attacked by two blokes. Uh, that's him up there. But as I was meditating on it, up ahead of me, I could see two men in a fist fight. There was one guy in an orange jacket, one guy dressed in black. They were standing on the side of the road, no one else around, no civilization around. Standing toe to toe in the snow, thumping each other. They were not wrestling. They were standing back, smacking each other in the head. Now eventually, the two of them kind of stumbled away from each other and the guy in orange ran up the road towards me. Now they're still half a kilometre away. But he ran up the other side of the road and the guy in black I saw kind of stagger around onto his feet and run up the hill through the snow and disappear. There was one bloke to start with, I saw him about 200 metres up ahead on the other side of the road laying into a, a bloke walking the, the other way. They had a big fight. And I just thought it was something personal. And then this other bloke got away and came up past me. And Eventually the guy in orange slowed to a walk. And as he got up alongside me, I yelled out in Russian, are you okay? And he yelled back at me, da, da, yes, yes. Flicked his hand and kept on walking. As I made it down, to that spot where those two men had had that fight continuing to pray out of the corner of my eye I saw movement I looked up the hill and running down the hill through the snow was the man dressed in black followed by a friend he'd gone and got help I was also wearing an orange jacket they were running straight at me and I knew that they thought I was the other guy and I swung around just in time to see the other guy in the orange jacket disappear over the hill. And these two men don't know that. They've run straight across the road at me and as they're running at me, the guy that was in the first fight, he stopped. He stopped a few metres short and the look on his face said, who's this guy? There was confusion written all over his face. And the two of them, whack, launched in. The two of them laying in, they ripped the top strap off my backpack. I managed to get the guy on the left around the throat and pushed him back at arm's length. And as I did that, the other guy came in trying to punch me and I pushed, grabbed him around the throat, pushed him out and suddenly had a Russian in both hands, held him out at arm's length. They're both still trying to punch me. But I'm nearly two metres tall. I've got a big wingspan. Holding them at arm's length, their arms weren't quite long enough. They're swinging underneath, not being able to connect. But because I had them around the throat, the obvious thing to do was attack my hands. Neither of them had cut their fingernails in a long time. They literally started to rip at the skin on my hands. I've got scars across my hands. One guy's thumb, the thumbnail went right through the webbing there. Eventually, after a lot of toing and froing and tussling, I actually stumbled, but as I stumbled backwards, I used that momentum to bring them together. I introduced them to each other and took off down the road running. One fellow just grabbed my poles, that's how they end up snapping, and he, uh, the two of them just started laying in. So, uh, held them both at arm's length and managed to get one of them on the ground while I pushed the other bike away, got one on the ground and then kept him there and held the other fella off. And then just 
eventually started running. But uh, he came after me. Shit, there's another bike here. I'm off. Look at that. They've snapped my pole and they've broken my backpack. We're gonna get out of here. Quick smart. Go on, go on, go on. Here's what was going on though. As I was praying that rosary and I saw that fight up ahead of me, I didn't stop praying. The fight broke apart. I continue praying. And then eventually I find myself in the middle of the fight. And I was still praying. I actually stopped praying a rosary. Thanks for the practical example of docility before my aggressors. I'm happy to meditate on it. Quite happy not to put in the middle of it. I couldn't do it. And there was one point in the fight where I had, there's a guy on the left, I had him in a headlock. The other guy I had around the, the shirt and I was actually doing little shirt punches trying to keep him away from me. This guy was still trying to punch me. So I was actually lifting my knee up into his chest. So I'm doing this and I'm still praying saying, I'm sorry, Jesus, I can't not fight back. I can't do it. I can't do what you did. I remember walking down that road afterwards thinking, you know what? Jesus could have been walking up Calvary. He chose not to fight back. He chose to let them kill him. He chose to let them torture him. This one of the wounds, that's where one of the guys grabbed me in the webbing. But the main damage they did was they snapped my poles in half. They had both the other ends, so I'm left with the handles. Now, as I headed on down through the forest out of that situation, I was contemplating what had happened. It, it took me a long time to get to the fifth sorrowful mystery. I was contemplating what that docility might have been like. I think for the first time, I had to acknowledge that Jesus just, he didn't just have the right to defend himself. One of them gave chase, but he gave up after a little bit. And now I'm just a bit concerned that they're gonna try and jump in a car and come back. Oh. I haven't seen any police yet. Normally there's police going up and down the road, but I haven't seen any today at all. So I'm hoping that there'll be some soon. And as I headed on out of Russia, that lesson was one that I kept coming back to. It was a lesson that I kept meditating on the docility of Christ before his aggressors. The fact that he could have fought back and he chose not to. Jesus loves you that much that he would be prepared to not defend himself. And I had every right to defend myself. The church says that I have the right to defend life, even my own life. Jesus chose not to. He loves us that much that he would go to his death for you, for me, and for those three Russian blokes, for all of us.
Well, I made it to a truck stop last night and they had little indoor cabins as well. There's a lot of the truckies are sleeping. You probably can't see it the camera, but there's a massive truck seat. They're all sleeping in their cabins, but I got to have a bunk inside for, the, for last night for about $6. And I shared a room with two Belarusian fellas. Uh, I've, I've woken up this morning, my wrist is really, uh, really sore. I must have strained it yesterday. I didn't realise it. Probably just in the adrenaline rush of uh, getting in battle with those two blokes and then getting away. But I can hardly move it. And it's going to be a bit tough this morning without the walking poles. I, mean, I don't have poles anymore, the walking stocks, because it's snowed overnight. Now, there isn't much, but there's enough. You see the, the tyre tracks through it here, which means it's going to be a little bit slippery as I walk today on the side of the road. So I have to be pretty careful. This is my last day in Russia, more than likely. So when we look into scripture, sometimes they can read as very dry words. But of course the reality is, this is the testimony of those who saw. Or, in Luke's case, it's Luke writing the testimony of people he interviewed who saw. And if we go back into Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 22, verse 63, the men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. And then when we go further afield to the actual carrying of the cross up Calvary, and at this point, Simon of Cyrene has been enlisted to carry his cross for him. It says, as they led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and waited for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. The time will come when you will say, blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. They will say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if men do these things when the tree, for if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? That cuts deep. That cuts deep now in this day and age. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will they do, do when it's dry? We are in that period now when the tree is dry and it's easy for us to lose sight of the fact that we are loved, that Jesus did all this for us and that we are called into a personal, intimate relationship. We are called to repent, to return to Jesus. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you for all you have done for us. Please forgive us for the times when we have neglected your love when we have forgotten your love, when we haven't taken the time to recognise what you have done for us. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would continually, patiently call us back into your love and you would help us to give our lives more fully to you. You would help to purify us, that our understanding of your love would be purified, that our love for one another would be purified. We pray, Lord God, that in all situations, whether it is us, in the Holy Mass, we may draw closer to you and that your will may be done. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Are you searching for purpose of life? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World.